Hello, everyone. So in today's class, we're going to talk about lipolysis and beta oxidation. So the question that I, the question that I brought for real life biochemistry for today's class are, have you ever thought why people can die from starvation? And have you ever thought why untreated diabetes mellitus can lead to coma? We are going to find the answers for this question today. So we saw that uh, we can synthesize fatty acids and we can use them to produce triacylglycerol and then we can store these triacylglycerols in the adipose tissue. But what if I want to, to use this triacylglycerol? What if I need the uh, energy and I need to mobilize this uh, reserve that are the triacylglycerol in the uh, adipose tissue? So, if I want to use this uh, energy reserve, lipids must be mobilized. So for that, stress of glycerol uh, need to be degraded to fatty acids and glycerol. And then these are going to be released from the adipose tissue uh, to go to the uh, tissues that are requiring energy. Second, the fatty acids must be activated and transported into mitochondria. And third, the fatty acids are going to be broken down into acetyl-CoA, which is then going to be processed in the citric acid cycle, leading to uh, the production of energy. So here we have an overview of the process of mob mobilization of triacylglycerol. So let's say we are in a situation that um, we are in a fasting state for several hours and uh, we need to mobilize the triacylglycerol. So how this happens? So glucagon um, can die to its receptor at the um, adiposic membrane. This is going to activate protein G that is going to activate adenylipsiclase, leading to the, the production of cyclic AMP, which activates uh, uh, PKA. So PKA can phosphorylate hormone sensitive lipase and can also phosphorylate perilipin. So once perilipin is phosphorylated, it releases CGI58, which recruits um, tri, uh, triacylglycerol lipase, which acts uh, on triacylglycerol, releasing diacylglycerol. So Phosphorylated perilipin uh, can combine to hormone sensitive lipase, uh, lipase phosphorylated and uh, act on diacylglycerol, uh, producing monosylglycerol. And then, monosylglycerol, through the action of um, monosylglycerol lipase, can release uh, fat acids and uh, glycerol. So, fat acids uh, circulate uh, through the blood. Um, bounded to albumin, and then at the myocyte level, through a transported fat acids can enter um, the myocyte and then be oxidized um, through beta oxidation and the citric acid cycle. Okay. So we saw that in the fat cell, triacylglycerol can be mobilized, uh, producing fat acids that can be uh, oxidized, oxidize, uh, leading to the production of energy. And what about uh, glycerol? So glycerol can be transformed into glycerol 3 phosphate and then dehydroxyacetone phosphate. We can uh, be used either in the glycolysis or gluconeogenesis, depending on the um, needed at the moment. Uh, but uh, glycerol uh, 3-phosphate can also be used for the synthesis of triacylglycerol. So this is an overview of the, um, the fate of uh, glycerol and fat acids reviewing a few things that we already saw. So fat acid, uh, fatty acid oxi oxidation takes place in mitochondria. And for this to happen, we need to, uh, to have the 
activation of fatty acids. And this is catalyzed by the enzyme acyl-CoA synthetase. So once we have the activated fatty acid, uh, we need to, to uh, have this activated fatty acid inside the mitochondrial matrix. So uh, how do we uh, bring this fatty acid activating to the mitochondrial matrix? And this happens um, with the help of carnitine. So carnitine is going to react with the activated fatty acid leading to the production of uh, acylcarnitine. Production of carnitine acyl transfer is one. So once we have acylcarnitine, then it can um, cross the membrane, um, the inner mitochondrial membrane, production of a translocase. Uh, and then inside the mitochondrial matrix, uh, carnitine is released and we are going to have the production of deactivated fatty acids. So once we have uh, our activated fatty acids here, carnitine is going to be released again and then can move back to the cytosol site uh, in exchange to acylcarnitine uh, again. And um, now we have carnitine on the cytosol site to be able to um, react to with activated fatty acid and make this process um, keep uh, working. So just to clarify, uh, I think it's a good moment to stop and think about uh, coenzyme A and uh, acyl-CoA. So coenzyme A in the mitochondrial matrix, it's involved in oxidative degradation of pyruvate, fatty acids, and some amino acids. And in the cytosol, it's involved in the fat acid biosynthesis. So on the other side, the CoA in the cytosol, it's involving the synthesis of membrane lipids and in the mitochondrial matrix in the oxidation and ATP production. Okay, so just a parallel between these two. So it is clear and you know uh, what is the function of each one uh, and where they exert, exert these functions. So once we have the activated fatty acids in mitochondria, now they are ready to be metabolized. Okay, so how does that happen? So we oxidize the fatty acid uh, two carbons at a time to acetyl-CoA. And the other thing is that we gather the released uh, high energy electrons to power oxidative phosphorylation. So here we see the two carbons Two, atom, uh, two carbon atoms at a time, um, leading to acetyl-CoA that is going to be, um, that is going to go to the uh, citric acid cycle. There will be in this process, the production of uh, NADH and FADH2 that are going to uh, deliver their electrons to the respiratory chain. So here we see um, the process of uh, removing the acetyl-CoA. Uh, so the process happens uh, two carbons at a time um, until we get to the last molecule of acetyl-CoA. And here again, the production of NADH and FADH2 uh, that are going to release their electrons at the respiratory chain, to the respiratory chain. So here's the overall uh, reaction when we have the oxidation of the fatty acid. Uh, here, specifically for formicoa, where we are going to use the 7 FAD, 7 uh, NAD, 7 CoA, 7 uh, molecules of water, and this is going to produce 8 acetyl CoA, 7 FADH2, and 7 NADH plus 7 hydrogen. So we are going to go to the uh, stoichiometry of uh, these uh, reactions and uh, understand specifically where the production of energy is coming from, uh, what uh, NADH is giving, what uh, FADH2 is giving, and uh, also considering that uh, although we do produce a lot of ATP through the process of uh, beta oxidation, 
uh, we have to remember that there is also, um, we also use ATP when we activate it the fatty acids. So we're going to go through all these in class. So for the oxidation of, we are talking about the oxidation of uh, saturated fatty acids, uh, fatty acids. So if I have the oxidation of monounsaturated fatty acid, in this case, we need the help of an enzyme called amyl coa isomerase that is going to reposition the double bond, converting the cis isomer to a trans um, isomer. On the other hand, if you want to, to do the oxidation of polyunsaturated fat acid, then we need two auxiliary enzymes. One is the amyl coa isomerase, and the other one is the 2 4 dianoyl this. So how does the regulation of fat acid synthesis in breakdown works? So the fable of fatty acyl CoA formed in the, the cytosol in the liver can be the bad oxidation by enzymes in mitochondria, or can be conversion into triacylglycerol and phospholipids by enzymes in the cytosol. So, um, the three-step process that we already saw that is also called Carnitin or Shuttle, um, by which uh, a fat acyl groups are carried from cytosol, uh, cytosolic fat acyl coin into mitochondrial matrix is the rating uh, limiting for fat acid oxidation. So two enzymes are key for the coordination of fat acid metabolism. And these two enzymes are the ACC, that is the acetyl coa carboxylase, that if you remember is the first enzyme in the synthesis of fatty acids. And the other enzyme that is key is the carnitine acyl transferase 1. That is the enzyme that limits the transport of fat acids into mitochondrial matrix for beta oxidation we just saw. So if you look here, if you have excess of glucose that cannot be oxidized or stored as a glycogen, what is going to happen is it is going to be converted in the cytosol into um, fat acids to be stored as triacylglycerol. So we're talking about this step. Okay, so from glucose, we're going to have the production of acetyl CoA. Um, acetyl CoA is going to originate melanyl CoA and it's going to be used for fat acid synthesis. So at the same time, melanyl CoA is going to inhibit carnitine acyl transferase 1. And it is, it, this is going to ensure that the oxidation of fat acids is inhibited. Now, the regulation also occurs uh, through two other enzymes that are regulated by metabolic uh, signaling energy sufficiency. So, for example, if you have an increased ratio of NADH um, for NAD, what is going to happen is the inhibition of two in, of um, beta hydroxy acyl CoA hydrogenase. And when I have an increase in the concentration of acetyl CoA, this is going to be to the inhibition of tyrolase. So in this situation, these are the two enzymes that are going to be inhibited. So through this process, we are going to inhibit the degradation of uh, fat acids. Another situation that also affects uh, and regulates synthesis and degradation of fat acids is um, vigorous muscle concentration, or for example, during fasting, when I have uh, low uh, concentration of ATP and a high concentration of ANP. So in this condition, I'm going to have uh, the activation of uh, AMPK, and we are going to have the phosphorylation of acetyl-CoA carboxylase uh, by uh, uh, AMPK. So if um, ACC is phosphorylated, it's going to be in the inactive state. So we are not going to have acetyl-CoA being uh, transformed in melanyl-CoA, and this is going to release the inhibition 
of carnitine acyl transferase one, and this is going to allow um, the fatty acyl carnitine transport into mitochondria, leading to that oxidation to restore the supply of ATP. So we already talked about uh, uh, different fuels. We talked about uh, using glucose uh, to obtain energy. We already talked about using parasites to obtain energy. And there is another thing that we can use to obtain energy that is ketone bodies. So let's talk a little bit about it, uh, this other source of energy. So what happens is that acetyl-CoA produced by fatty acid degradation, most parts of it is going to enter the citric acid cycle. But some can form alternative food that are the ketone bodies. Okay? So the um, disadvantage of uh, ketone bodies are that is that they don't generate as much ATP as fatty acids. But on the other side, they have the advantage of uh, being water soluble. So they are easily transportable uh, form of acet uh, acetal units. So ketone bodies include acetone, acetoacetate, and the beta hydroxy butyrate. And the synthesis of this ketone body uh, happen in later in the mitochondria. So we start with two acetyl CoA, and uh, this can lead to the production of acetyl acetate uh, that can be converted to acetone that can, can be exhaled and acetoacetate can also uh, be converted to beta hydroxy uh, butyrate and acetoacetate and uh, beta hydroxy butyrate can be transported to, by the blood to extra hepatic tissues to be converted to acetylcholine. Okay. So this is how we synthesize ketone uh, bodies, but uh, I can also use them as a fuel. So liver cells lack the enzyme that is called um, beta catalacyl CoA transferase. So that means that the liver can produce um, ketone bodies for other tissues, but uh, the liver doesn't consume it. So high levels of acetyl acetate in the blood um, shows that there is an abundance of acetyl uh, <coughs> units and it will decrease the uh, rate of lipolysis in adipose tissue. So here uh, we have the hepatocyte showing that uh, fat acids uh, um, can be oxidized leading to the production of acetyl-CoA Acetyl-CoA can be used in the citric acid cycle, but can also uh, can be used in the production of uh, ketone bodies that can be used as a source of energy yeah, for heart, skeletal muscles, kidney, and brain. The brain preferentially uses glucose as fuel, but can adapt to, to the use of acetoacetate and uh, the beta hydroxy butyrate under starvation conditions, for example, when glucose is unavailable. However, the brain cannot use fat acids as fuel uh, once they don't cross the blood brain uh, barrier. So when uh, glycogen levels are low, why can't we take advantage of fat stores and convert fat acids uh, into glucose? So if you remember the reaction uh, from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, it's in irreversible, so we cannot go in this direction from acetyl-CoA synthesized uh, pyruvate. Uh, so acetyl-CoA generated by fat acid degradation cannot be converted into pyruvate and oxalacetate in animals. And if you remember um, the citric acid cycle, we have uh, uh, acetyl-CoA uh, entering the cycle um, through the reaction with oxalacetate uh, production citrate. But what happens is that these two carbons that enter the cycle, they also leave. So uh, one carbon is uh, released through the reaction catalyzed by isocitrates by, um, by dehydrogenase, and the other one is uh, right here by alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex. So there are situations that we're going to have an overproduction of ketone bodies in the liver. 
So two of these conditions are starvation and untreated diabetes. So in starvation, what happens is that we have, uh, we don't have energy, so we need to do gluconeogenesis. So what gluconeogenesis is going to do, it's going to need oxalocetate, for example, and it's going to um, uh, deplete the, the citric acid cycle intermediate. So we're going to take oxalocetate to synthesize um, glucose to do gluconeogenesis, and then this is going to compromise the functionality of the uh, citric acid cycle. So in this case, the acetyl-CoA, it's going to be directed to the synthesis of ketone volume. In untreated diabetes, insulin level is insufficient. insufficient. So extra fatty tissues cannot take up glucose, glucose efficiently from the blood. So again, uh, uh, it's going to be understood that we need to synthesize glucose. So we need to do gluconeogenesis and the same process is going to happen depleting the uh, citric acid uh, intermediates. So in this case, there is a signal that uh, we don't need to synthesize uh, fat acids. Uh, we need the energy right now. So melanin-CoA, it's going to reduce the levels of melanin-CoA. And this is going uh, to relieve the inhibition of the carnitine acyltransferase one. And as a consequence, we are going to have uh, fatty acids enter, uh, enter mitochondria to be uh, degraded to acetyl-CoA. So we can uh, have energy. <clears throat> so uh, in the condition that uh, we have low glucose, again, so the oxaloacetate levels are going to drop because we are going to use for the synthesis of the glucose. Uh, cyclic uh, acid, um, citric acid, cyclic is going to slow, gluconeogenesis is going to increase. Fat acids are going to be, um, triacylglycerol are going to be mobilized from uh, adipose tissue, releasing free fat acids that are going to the liver. So in the liver, we're going to have the uh, oxidations of free fat acids producing um, acetyl, um, acetyl uh, clay. But acetyl-CoA cannot go to citric acid cycle because it is slow. So we are going to have to direct acetyl-CoA to the production of ketone bodies. So ketone bodies go to the blood and drop the pH. And this has consequences that are the coma and the death. So for today's learning's objective, we have to understand how peripheral tissues gain access to lipid energy reserves, uh, storing adipose tissue, um, oxidation of saturated, monosaturated, and polyunsaturated fat acids, regulation of fat acid synthesis and breakdown, synthesis and degradation of ketone bodies, fat acid and ketone bodies metabolism under different situations, such as fasting and diabetes. So um, that's for today's class, and uh, I look forward to see you uh, in class so we can discuss more about these topics. <laughs>